if you uh, grew up in the church, you may have gone all your life not thinking it's, it's kind of ridiculous to sit in an empty room or whatnot and talk and where are your words going? Are they just bouncing off the ceiling or, or uh, how, where are they going? And, and if, you, if you've grown up in the church for a long time, you may also not understood how wonderful it is to be able to pray and thought about what's really going on. If there's no God, then prayer is kind of like self-help, I guess, although it's a kind of weird form of it. Uh, if there's no God, prayer is not going to do anything for you. If there's no God, then life is meaningless. Your life is short. When you go, the universe is not going to remember you. The universe certainly won't care. And uh, all these words you speak, whether they're to other people or whether to your imaginary God, if there's no God, uh, all of them are wasted breath, so you can pretend all you want. Uh, love is not the center of, of meaning, the galaxy, the universe, everything. But if there's a God, then suddenly every choice matters. How we live our life matters. How we treat other people matters. And of course, if there's a God and he's asked us to commune with him, to communicate with him, think about that. People make prayer so magical. I hate that. Uh, well, it's supernatural because God's involved, but of course, the supernatural is natural for God, so there you go. Uh, Prayer is talking with your Heavenly Father. So I can talk with Jason. Of course, it's a different relationship when Jason and I are talking with God than when we're talking to each other. He's the King of Kings. But what it is is we share thoughts, we share ideas, we share our hearts with one another. And when we talk with God, it's the exact same thing. Jesus uh, spoke to his Heavenly Father. He prayed. But his heavenly father also spoke back. Here is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Uh, this is communication. There's communication within the members of the Trinity. Prayer is communication with God. The creator of the universe wants you to talk with him. Every time the wind blows, leaves fall off the tree. God knows how many leaves are on the ground. He knows how many leaves are still in the trees. That's the God who wants to talk with you. The mighty king that knows how much sand is on the beach before the wave comes, and how much sand is on the beach when the wave recedes. The Bible says he knows every strand of hair. I always say he knows before and after you shampoo. He knows every atom in every molecule. The Bible says that he has a name for all the stars. And, of course, we know there are trillions of stars. God calls them by name. Apparently, the Bible never says he name, calls the grains of sand by name. That's interesting to me. Stars. He thinks they're cool, I think. He made them. He's a, he's a creator that makes things beautiful. Sound of wind in trees. Listen to that. Rustling grass, listen to that. A beach, listen to that. He made us a world where we get serenaded by birds. Music. What kind of world? It didn't have to be that way, that we have music all around us all the time. It did not have to be that way. The crash of lightning, mighty waves smashing on a beach, all of these things, God made it what it would look like. He made what it would sound like. The incredible artistry of an orange-red sky. The incredible artistry of a beautiful blue sky with the orange leaves and the red leaves against it or the, or the greens, the different hues of greens that we have in the summer, all the fields of flowers we have in the spring, all the different kinds of flowers. God thought of it all. God made it all. And he wants to talk with you. The most powerful being there is, wants to talk with you. 
the greatest artist there is, wants to talk to you. The one that loves you far more than we love ourselves. We're good at being upset with ourselves. Far more than even your daddy and your mommy. He wants this. He wants us to talk with him. What a privilege if we could talk to somebody famous or the president or some other person. President's nothing compared to king of kings. And we get to go right into his throne room. Say, Daddy, can you help me with this? Daddy, I want to be more like you. Do you think he likes that prayer? What kind of parent, their child looks up at him and says, I want to do that too. Not when you're doing bad stuff, but when you're doing good stuff, you know. What a joy in God's heart when he hears that we want to be like him. Prayer is not magic. It's not like the force in Star Wars. Prayer doesn't control God. You know, the idea of magic is I do something mystical and I can com control supernatural forces. Brothers and sisters, you cannot control God. He's big, we're little. Prayer is talking with a God who loves us enough that he opened up a way for us to communicate with him. And we can do this only because he wants us to communicate with him. If God didn't care, then we could shout, and wave our fists, and cry and plead on this little speck of dust going through the universe. You know, the earth is moving really fast, going around the sun, and the sun's moving really fast. Uh, he didn't have to pay attention to us. There's, there's, they're amoebas. We're amoebas to God. If he didn't love us, if we weren't made in his image. We get to communicate with God because he wants us to communicate with him because he loves us. Prayer, just like Aaron, just like marriage, right, is God's idea. We don't make the rules for either one. Prayer, God's idea. And God himself, this is beautiful, God himself is going to teach us how to pray today. That's cool. Uh, God, in the Bible, gives us certain prayers. He says, pray for peace of Jerusalem. Okay, if God said it, I ought to be praying for Jerusalem. Jesus tells us, pray that more workers will come for the harvest. You know what he's talking about? The harvest is souls that don't know yet Jesus yet. Pray for more Christians that will get off the bench and get into the game and start drawing people to, the, to his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died to bring people to him, and then he says, pray that more people get involved in the work of it. Well, we said in Sunday school class today, pray that our church, because this is where you plug in, this is where you serve. Every Christian needs to be part of a local church. It doesn't have to be ours, but they've got to be part of one, right? Pray that God gets more people involved, not only the people we have here, God, bring in some more workers. Pray that God blesses the other churches in our community, like Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, most parts of the world. Uh, pray that God brings more workers to their churches if they're preaching the gospel. Lord, please flood America with workers for this harvest. And Lord, there's a harvest in China and India and in Europe and all over the place, in Africa, Lord, the Middle East. Have you ever, instead of just being angry about all the violence in the Middle East, have you ever pr prayed for a flood of missionaries, of, of local people to rise up and share their faith? Of, I, I've heard Chinese Christians saying, this is so beautiful. They bring the gospel to Saudi Arabia. They bring the gospel to, because China's a wealthy country. The Chinese middle class is actually larger than the American middle class right now. I'm not sure the exact definition, but it was something like 30,000 to, to 170,000 or something they were defining it as. There's more people in China in that monetary range than the United States. Of course, as a percentage, it's still smaller. But China is now able to send people around the world. A lot of the biggest building projects in Africa right now aren't from Western Europe or the United States. It's from China. Well, when you have a building project, what do you need? You need Chinese people to come and do it. And a lot of these now are Christians, and they're saying, we're able to talk to people about Jesus that would not listen to an American or a, or a European. So God, flood the Middle East. If, if people aren't going to listen to Americans, because we're the great Satan, you know, from their perspective, Lord, blindside them with some Chinese Christians, Lord. People that just love Jesus and, and love others enough to take that risk to share it in difficult areas. 
So pray for God to send more workers. We need them here. Other of wonderful, wonderful churches in our community need them, and we need them all over the world. And God tells you to pray for that. So God's instructing us how to pray. And uh, today we're going to see people come right up to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. Aren't you glad that that's in the Bible? I mean, isn't that cool? It's recorded. So God comes in flesh, and people say, how should we pray? And this is what God tells us. You couldn't get any more cool than that. God is going to tell us how we're going to pray. So let's turn to Luke right now, Luke chapter 11. Losing, all, losing the notes actually meant the message is more focused and streamlined. I was going to get off a field into some neat areas, but maybe it's better this way. So Luke chapter 11, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. We're going to go straight through, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to unpack it a bit. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. So he was praying. Isn't that neat? Because he's, why does God need to pray? He's talking to his heavenly father. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. I I like that. Jesus is telling a story. Suppose you have a friend. Think about that. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have any food to offer him. And suppose... The one inside says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't give up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely give up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, see, he just says that, like, yeah, this is God. He knows we're evil. If you guys, even though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yeah, that's really neat. Isn't it interesting the things that God decides to put in the Bible? Well, first off, probably a lot of you have noticed that this is different than the version of the Lord's Prayer you've seen. The version of the Lord's Prayer we normally say is from Matthew, and that was part of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's all these people around. This time is a different circumstance. Jesus is praying. And after he's done praying, uh, one of his disciples goes and asks him about it. And I'm guessing that, uh, you know, Matthew was an eyewitness. Luke was not an eyewitness, but he interviewed people. Uh, I'm guessing that Jesus taught people how to pray many times. Different crowds, different groups of people, and he taught them. And they both boil down to the same, but the other list is longer. It's a little bit longer prayer. There's some things that are different. Uh, But let's go back now, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 13 first, and then we're going to go back and look at the prayer. Uh, You have this story Jesus tells uh, about somebody who's shamelessly audacious, and they're knocking on the door saying, open up, give me bread, open up, give me bread, go away, open up, give me bread. I said go away, my kids are sleeping, open up, give me bread. And, And there's two views on this. One view is that God is the irritated friend that doesn't really want to get out of bed, doesn't really want to answer your prayers, and if we just bug him enough, he'll do what we want. The other view is Jesus is drawing this contrast and saying, listen, God's not like that. Even that guy will answer if you go to him, but God loves you so much, you know. Uh, 
I believe that the second view is probably correct, but I think we get hung up on this debate about what's actually going on in the story when we've missed the point, or we, we don't miss the point, but we sometimes we're so intent on the debate that we miss the point that Jesus is saying, go and ask, and you will get it. Go and ask. God wants to answer your prayers. Go and, the whole point is that we should be bold in our requests, uh, bold to go before Jesus and uh, before God and ask him these things, and God wants to answer our prayers. Uh, the Bible tells us to be persistent in our prayers, to be passionate in our prayers. We Talk to God. He wants to hear from you. It's very clear in this passage that God loves to answer prayer. Uh, which, which of your fathers are going to give you your son a snake or a scorpion? Of course not. Now, you guys are evil. Jesus just says it matter-of-factly. He's holy God. He's here because we're evil. That's why he had to die on the cross. That's the whole thing since Adam and Eve, the human race is evil. So God, in flesh, doesn't say, I don't want to make you guys feel bad. Or He just says it the way it is, but he loves us, you know. He says, you guys being evil, even though you're evil, you still want to do good for your own kids, right? You don't need Jesus. You don't need to have the Holy Spirit to love your kids and want to do good for them. Everybody in the world wants to, to love their kids. Of course, that love is broken. It's not as good as it should be. But Jesus says, even though you guys are evil, you want to do good for your kids, how much more does God want to do good for us? Then in this passage, in the parallel passage, Jesus doesn't mention the Holy Spirit, but here he decides to mention the ultimate good. What would be the best thing that could happen to anybody? It would be to have God's Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit helps us to see life the way we should see it. The Holy Spirit sometimes is, well, he's kind of a pain, isn't he? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't let us get away with our sins without feeling bad about them. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. We often feel like, well, I could, wish I could turn off God for a while because I want to be, I want to have a good anger. <laughs> you know, I want to hold on to this grudge. The Holy Spirit is saying, what are you doing? Are you an idiot? Seriously, I'm not. That is, the Bible says we're a fool when we hold on to a grudge, right? So the Bible, so the Holy Spirit is here talking, but the Holy Spirit also comforts us because God doesn't look at us and say, are you so weak? Get up. What's your problem? God comes and puts his hands on us and says, stand up. I know the journey is too much for you. The Holy Spirit is here comforting us, giving us strength. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. The Holy Spirit actually prays to God for us when, when we don't know how to pray. And just inside of us, the Holy Spirit is groaning. In the, in the, within the Trinity, there's communication between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is talking to the Lord for us. We're getting close to Christmas season. I've told you this story. Some of you will know it as soon as I start to tell it. But I was uh, in Japan as a missionary, and the pastor's wife, uh, Naomi Sensei, was translating for me, and I was giving a Christmas message. And there was a lot of little kids there, about 30 little kids, uh, from probably four or five up to about uh, maybe 18. And... There was a candlelight service, and everybody's got the candlelights. It's dark, it's quiet. We sing Silent Night in, in Japanese. And, and I said, God wants to give you this amazing gift. What could be more wonderful than forgiveness of your sins and eternal life? And out of the blue, one of the little kids, his name was Yohei, said, yeah, that would be pretty good, but I think a Nintendo would be pretty good too. <laughs> and uh, I remember the pastor's wife went, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I laughed. And the first thing I said was, you know, God made humor. I think he probably found that humorous himself. But Jesus Christ is talking about the ultimate gift that could be given is the Holy Spirit. So yes, we want people to have physical blessing. Yes, we want, when, when somebody comes and says, please pray for my relative, my friend, they're deathly ill, I always ask, are they saved? Why do I do that? Because even if they get saved Physically, this time, if they're still on a journey to hell, we haven't done much except push the pause button. What we need to do is make sure everybody gets that Holy Spirit, everybody gets right with Jesus, so that there's an eternity of joy awaiting them. So Jesus Christ, when he talks about the greatest good that could possibly come, he talks about the Holy Spirit. You know, he doesn't say, don't pray for 
I'm hungry, Lord. Where's the next meal going to come from? He actually says, pray for that. He doesn't say, don't pray when you're physically sick. He never says that. But he wants to bring this ultimate healing, this healing to our souls, and that's of paramount importance. The Bible tells us, bring all of your prayers and petitions to Jesus, all of them. There's nothing too small. I, instead of worrying, well, this is too minor, I don't want to trouble God with this, let's be in so much communication with God that we bring everything to Jesus. God, I can't find my sunglasses. God, I, can't, I don't have gas for my car. God, pray about it all. But while we're praying about all of that, let's remember the the things that God wants to capture our heart with, the things that should be directing the direction of our prayers and the direction of our life. Lord, I want to be, so, Lord, we're praying for workers. Lord, I want to be one of those workers for the harvest. Lord, please let me share the gospel with somebody today. Lord, please bring people around me that I can invite to church. You know, as we're praying for, Lord, my knee hurts today. That's good. Pray. But move beyond that. And let's have the heart of God on these things. So the Holy Spirit, uh, please direct my prayer life. Teach me to pray, Lord. Uh, now, both Paul and Jesus, by the way, prayed persistently for God the Father to remove some difficulties in their lives. Remember? Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And there's again, there's a lot of debate. What is that thorn in the flesh? And I don't know, and so I'm not going to pretend like I know. I've got some ideas. Uh, and you know what God told him? No. Now, he prayed three times. He was persistent. It wasn't a lack of faith that caused him to stop praying. It was faith that allowed him to accept God's answer, which he probably didn't like. Jesus, before he went to the cross, prayed, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He was not suicidal. He didn't have a death wish. He was the author of life. He loved life more than anybody. If there's another way to accomplish this mission, Lord, yet not my will but yours be done. In both, and Jesus went back and prayed with his disciples, went back, prayed the same thing. Remember, Again, persistence in prayer, praying for, for a few hours, passionate in his prayer. In both cases, the Father said no. And both Christ and Paul respond in faith by accepting the Father's decision. So, you know, we prayed for Virginia before she went. She's had some lapses where the doctor said she's going to die, and she came back for, for several years. We prayed each time. This time kind of felt different, but we prayed, and God had a different answer. From his perspective, a better answer. Uh, the Bible actually says, what kind of God do you worship? The Bible says God rejoices in the death of his saints. So we're praying, God, we want to keep our father, we want to keep our brother, we want to keep our sister. And he's saying, sometimes he says, okay, I know, I know they've got work to do yet. But when they come home, he rejoices. I brought you out of that place. That was hard for you, wasn't it? There was a lot of pain there. There was a lot of sorrow here. And I'm bringing you home. God rejoices when his people come to heaven. But the Bible also says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If people are fighting God and they're keeping him away, there's nothing good comes out of that death. Nothing. So God wants us to be working and bringing people to him. And Jesus and Paul both acquiesce to the will of God. And their faith is first demonstrated by praying. And then their faith is demonstrated by acceptance. And we've got to work on both. principle here, pray consistently, pray with faith, but also accepts God's decision with faith. Uh, before we continue, let's pray about that, because that's hard. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, you give us this great privilege to pray, and then we hardly take advantage of it, and we're distracted, and we think so many things are more important. We're like, we're running around trying to prepare the meal instead of choosing what's better. Lord, uh, teach us to pray. Teach us persistence in our prayer. Teach us to pray with passion. And Lord, when it becomes clear to us what your answer is going to be, help us to have the faith to endure, to accept, to choose to glorify you 
through hardship, through whatever pain or difficulty may come our way. Lord, I want to pray right now for everyone in the church who has a physical ailment, physical difficulty. Lord, we lay it before you, and Lord, we love to see, we're people that love to see you work. We love your miracles, Lord. We love it when you bring, bring these reasons to rejoice, Lord. So we pray for healing for everyone, from minor ailments, Lord, to serious difficulties. Father, please heal us and give us reason to celebrate and rejoice. Father, I pray for everyone who's going through financial difficulties, Lord. You'd give them wisdom with their finances, Lord, that you'd bless them financially, Father, that there would be uh, unexpected outcomes, Lord, that would be positive, Lord, that they could take a hold of their situation, Lord, and, and that future days would be better than the past days. Lord, we know you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Please bless the people in our church financially. Lord, relationships can give us a taste of heaven. They can also be a lot like hell. Father, please repair the relationships of everyone in our church. Lord, help us not to waste our days holding grudges with bitterness or anger. Please set us free, Lord. Father, please heal our relationships, Lord, and heal us in our souls, Lord. Help us to be good forgivers, Lord. Teach us what it means to let go of a grudge, Lord, to let go of our anger, our bitterness. Heavenly Father, we know that in relationships it takes two to tango. Lord, we know that this side of heaven, death is an outcome that all of us are going to have to face, and that this is a world of sickness. Lord, we know this is a world of tears. Father, when you don't answer prayers the way we want you to, please protect us from bitterness. Instead, Lord, give us the faith to accept everything that comes from your hands. Give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the ability, Lord, to choose to honor you no matter what we're going through to live lives that are pleasing to you, Lord. We don't want to live our lives for ourselves. We want to live them for you. And Lord, please use each one of us to grab other people, maybe wayward Christians, maybe people on that highway to hell, Lord, and bring them into your family. Please grow our faith. And please grow our church in this ministry, Lord. Please use us, Father. In your name we pray, amen. All right, I'm going to go back right now to uh, 1 through 4. The neat thing about the Lord's Prayer, well, the one in Matthew starts off, Our Father, right? Our Father. Have you ever thought about that? For the, I, that hit me for the first time last year, and, and I, I mentioned this to you guys when we were studying Matthew, and a lot of you looked at me like, you're not so bright, are you? Which was the appropriate thing. I have always read the Lord's Prayer, how does it apply to me? How should I do this? Our Father, wait, wait, wait. This is a prayer to be said in community. This is a community prayer. Our Father. We say this together as a group. We direct it toward the Lord. Together we're saying we are a family, and together we affirm that you are our Heavenly Father. We're coming to you. So, Father. And the word here is kind of like Papa. It's Abba. It's Daddy. So in the Old Testament, we had all these, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and we had all these grand ways to address uh, God, and he had different titles and, and stations and in, in words that described who he was. And people say, how should we pray Jesus? He says, call him Daddy. Call him Papa. Father. Isn't that personal? This is the kind of relationship that Jesus Christ has opened up for us. Father hallowed be your name. Daddy, your name is special. Christians often argue, well, what does it mean to swear, and where can I draw the lines, and what is it okay to, to say? Why do we have to use God's name as an insult? Why do we have to use God's name when we're angry? I know that using the Lord's name in vain means a lot more than that. It means attaching false theology to him. It, 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 it it means all sorts of things. 
But that doesn't mean it's okay to use God's word name like a cuss word, does it? God loves you more than anybody. Jesus loves you. I wouldn't use my wife's name as a swear word. Why would I use God's name that way? So it means more than that. I'm not saying that's all it means. I understand it's lots more than that. But God, your name is special, and I want to hallow your name. I want to make it holy. I want to make your name wonderful. Brothers and sisters, quit acting like pagans. Amen? Amen. Father, your name is special to me, and I want to honor it with my life. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. You notice whose kingdom it's not? It ain't my kingdom. It ain't your kingdom. God, I want you to rule in my family. You call the shots in my family. God, I want you to rule in my heart. You call the shots in my heart. I, I'm, I'm a bad king. I'm not good at this, Lord. Why should I try and sit on your throne? Father, you rule in my life. And God, we want you to rule in the hearts and lives of the people of our church. Your kingdom come at Foundation Church, right? And I want to grab the whole of this soul city. Lord, your kingdom in Janesville, where, where people are putting you first, where, where your will is being done, where people are learning to forgive, where people are learning to, 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 to draw uh, alongside people that are different, that struggle with different things, and people are wanting to be a blessing to one another instead of being a curse to one another. Lord, we're sick of all the messes that we make. We're sick of the, world, the world's messes, Lord. We want your will to be done in our community. And Lord, we see the Middle East, we see what's going on in Africa with all this warfare, Lord. We see what's going on in, in the secular arena, Lord, and all these different views that are pushing up and kicking up against you, Lord. Your kingdom come in the United States and across this globe, Lord. We want to see your rule of righteousness. We want to see goodness prevail. We want to see justice prevail. Is that the cry of your heart? When's the last time you prayed like that? Lord... Let your kingdom come in my life. Let your kingdom come in my family. Let your kingdom rule our nation, Lord. Give us, again, this is a communal prayer, right? Give us each day our daily bread. And I pray for everyone in the church. Bless them financially. Bless them physically, Lord. Bless them relationally. Lord, the things we need to survive. But as we saw in the Sermon on the Mount, when we give the longer version in the context, He's talking about much more than physical provision, isn't he? He's talking about, Lord, what do we truly need to survive and thrive? Lord, we need the bread of life. We need your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, give us our provision, not just physical. Even more importantly, Lord, give us spiritual provision because we succumb to bitterness. We succumb to, we're bound by regrets and disappointments and broken dreams. Lord, we don't want these things to rule our lives. We want you to rule our lives. Provide for us spiritually, Lord. And then forgive us our sins. Again, communally as a church, Lord, forgive the sins of Foundation Church where we didn't love enough, we got off track, we argued about the wrong things. Lord, forgive your church in America that sometimes we put our faith in politicians instead of you. Lord, forgive, your, this, forgive America, Lord, the way we, we, we take sex so casually, the results in so many hundreds of thousands of abortions, Lord, the way we pit one racial group against another, Lord, forgive, the, the, uh, forgive us our sins. Lord, again, communally, we're asking God to be a forgiver. Now, and individually, we know when we ask God to forgive your sins, you know what he does? He forgives your sins. He doesn't only forgive your past sins, he forgives the blood of Jesus Christ transcends time. All of your sins are forgiven. And so I encourage people to say, Lord, Thank you for forgiving me my sins. But when Jesus is approached, God in flesh, he said, how should we pray? He says, pray communally, Lord, forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And again, this is so interesting to me that God says, I want you to pray this way. I want you to put a statement of intent in there. Lord, your people, we're saying we want to forgive. Just like you forgive, Lord, that's what we want to be. Interesting that God in flesh tells us to pray like this. Put down a statement of intent. I will be a forgiver. We will be a church that forgives. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And then this version is shorter. It says, and lead us not into temptation. Amen. What is that? Lead us not into temptation. 
That's a confession that I rely on God. I need his hand. I need his help. This is a confession of weakness. Lord, when the devil comes, I'm so weak. Lord, I need you. Lord, I fall to the temptation of hopelessness and despair and depression and anger and, and, and all these, in greed, Lord, and lust and all these different things. Lord, I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. <laughs> I'm utterly wretched without you, Lord. Lead, lead us not in temptation is an admission that, Lord, I don't have a chance without you. Lord, please save me from myself. The longer version in, the longer version in Matthew chapter 6 uh, is part of the Sermon on the Mount, as we said. Let me read that one for you. Our Father in heaven. Isn't that neat? Our Father in heaven says, we're little and we're down here. You're big and you're up there. Again, who gets to call the shots? Well, if you're on your knees and saying, our Father in heaven, you're acknowledging, I don't really have the right to call the shots. I'm not able to call the shots. Lord God, it's going to be your will. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You know, you're beautiful in the eyes of heaven when you stop praying, Lord, do this for me, do that for me, give it my way. It's got to be my way, Lord, or I'm walking. After he gave us everything, after he died for us on the cross, after he opens up heaven for us, let's start praying, Lord, your will be done in my life. Because I'm not sharp. And I say stupid things, I do foolish things. Lord, your will be done. On earth, right here, just as it is in heaven. Give us today, today what we need to survive. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this is an admonition that Satan is real, and Satan wants to kick your butt. He wants to kick our church. He wants to break your marriage. He wants to break your church. He wants to break your friendships. Satan wants to destroy, and he's a liar. And I don't want us to buy what the devil's selling. I don't want us to buy what the devil's selling. And so when he starts whispering in your ear, boy, that person's laugh, I hate that person's laugh. I hate the person at the back of that person's head. I, I hate the way that person sings. I hate the person always tells the same jokes again and again. See, I'm defending myself there. When you hear that, that ain't the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Holy Spirit's not giving you a list of all the things your wife, li wife does wrong, gentlemen. Ladies, that's not the Holy Spirit that's telling you to be dissatisfied and upset with your husband all the time. It is not God. And we have pastors in the church, and they're supposed to lead, and when we find ourselves resenting that leadership, that is not the Holy Spirit. Deliver us from the evil one because he's hunting, and he wants to take us out of the game. Why are these two versions different? Well, again, one of them, well, what Jesus was praying, one of them was part of a long sermon on, on how we should live as children of God, also on salvation. Uh, I don't know exactly why the two versions are different. My guess is that, again, Christ gave this teaching on prayer several times to different audiences, and it was a little bit different each time. That's okay. The heart of it is the same. Don't get, oh, they don't line up. The intent, the heart of this is the same, and they were talking about different situations. We find ourselves bent up and out of shape. And, well, I'm not going to, the two versions are different. So there it goes. What? That, just admit it. You're looking for an excuse to run away from God at that point. Different circumstances, different situations, different versions. And it's beautiful that we've got both. I also think this is excellent proof that Luke is written very early. That it's an early gospel. Sometimes people say, well, these things were written so much later. Well, we know they're not because the early church quoted from them so often. You've heard me say before, if you take the first two or three generations of Christian pastors, they wrote to each other, primarily in Greek, so often that they would have uh, been able to, you can reconstruct almost the entire New Testament from the first three generations of pastors just from their quotes of the New Testament. So we know that there's no such thing as a late gospel. But how close to the beginning? I think this shows that Luke is a very early gospel because if Matthew's longer version were already being said, 
uh, as a part of a catechism. They were already being said in churches, and everybody was repeating this, uh, as we know it later became used in churches still to this day. There would have been no reason for Luke to set down a shorter version. I think Luke wrote this very early on. He interviewed, and this, and, and, and somebody, one of the disciples probably said, and then we went to him because he was praying. He's a good prayer. <laughs> and so we asked him, well, teach us how to pray, and this is what he told us, so he wrote it down. So we have an, a longer version in Matthew, a shorter version here, and I think it's wonderful that we both have both. Uh, usually I do a closing prayer, or sometimes I just kind of walk away and let you think about it, but today I want us to all stand, and we're going to say the short version together. And uh, this is something that for the last 2,000 years, Christians all around the world have been saying, and we're going to get to say it. And do you know there's Christians in China that say this prayer? There's Christians in India that say this prayer? Christians in South America say this prayer? All of us united by the blood of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. This is an ancient prayer, and we're going to say it together. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.